Um, so I should also um, add a few people to this. The well that David refers to is the one that I'll be showing you some photos from. Um, probably also thank some of my colleagues from Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources, Don Freeban, uh, Ed Hollowitz, and um, a whole range of people at BHP also who are involved in this work um, and drilling contractors. So just take a bit of an overview. Today I'm going to show you some photos and stuff from one well which went bad and it's been fixed at great cost. But the background to this is there's a whole lot of, there's a whole range of wells, hundreds, which um, are all at risk of failure and they get rehabilitated over a bunch of years with um, what's called GABSI or the Great Artesian Basin Sustainability Initiative. Um, and this is ongoing work, it's been going on for a number of years and there's more to fix. But this is a really good example of why that work's being undertaken. The only thing you should take away from this is if you do it right in the first place, you won't have a problem. If you don't do it right, it goes wrong really badly. So that's, that's the thing to remember. So this is just some of the locations of the wells we've worked on in the last couple of years. Um, the one we, I can figure this out. The one which we worked on, this talk is about, it's called Georgia Bore, which is that one there. Um, but pretty much all of these are hot, high pressure, uh, when I say hot, um, between 80 and 100 degrees C, it's the water coming out on the surface. And when I say high pressure, they can flow anywhere up to 30 litres a second or more, which is um, difficult to control. So you really need engineering works in place at the surface to deal with that. Just cover some of that. I'll skip on to some photos. So, like I said, there's a there's a few wells that we've worked on. This is an example of one um, from the far northwest, far northeast corner, Haddon Downs, where the wellhead um, is badly corroded and also covered in deposits of travertine. Um, for some reason, there was there's a, a hole's been punched in the top, and you can see a very hot very high pressure, very difficult to deal with. You don't want to leave it there for reasons which you'll see in three slides. This is another example of one which is lower pressure. So as you can see, it's not gushing out at high pressure. It's still hot, but not too hot to touch. This is about 50 degrees, this one. Um, again, corroded, lots of deposits of travertine. And you can see it's completely open. That that valve that you can see there, the valve handle was open and it's just sitting there flowing 24-7. In this case, because it wasn't high pressure, the, the pool of water you see around it was not all that deep. So it was, it was possible to get a rig over that and fix it. So here's another example of a leak. This one's a bit more concerning because the water's not coming up out of the wellhead. It's not, it's not that the wellhead's leaking, something's happening underground. Um, but you might look at that and go, well, you know, you could probably still get a rig over that. You could probably still fix it. That photo was taken in early December, I think. That was two months later. I don't know how deep this pool was. It could have been two metres, could have been five metres, could have been saturated down 20 metres. Very risky to go anywhere near it. The water temperature there was 80 degrees or 78 degrees when you measure it. Um, how do you get over that to fix it? That's a really difficult problem. Also, what's gone wrong? We don't even know by looking at that where the leak's coming from. Is it this well is 1,000 metres deep? Is it at 950 metres that there's a problem? Or is it at two metres below the surface that there's a problem? How you fix it depends on where the leak's coming from. So anyway, we, you can see the puzzling there on the corner of what we're going to do. Um, the way we approached this was to run geophysical logging probes down the well to try and find where the leak is. They range from simple as just a probe to measure how big the hole is to acoustic probes that measure whether there's cement behind the casing. Because ideally this well should have been constructed with cement from top to bottom and the production zone at the bottom. So this was how we got access to it. Um, with some pon heavy pontoons that we took up there and, and secured in the pond. Um, we were able to then 
use the crane truck to get the probes over the hole and we were able to get, it's not a great photo, but you can see the infrastructure that we had to put in place to control this while we were logging it, which was difficult in itself because, like I said, quite a lot of flow. So we had to put several different pieces of pipe work, um, a bypass, we actually logged it while it was flowing. And this, well, we were thinking we would have to put what's called a stuffing chamber, which means that probe, which you can see is quite long, more than three metres, oh, it's four metres long, um, inside a chamber and then open the well to let the pressure equilibrate in there and then run it through. Luckily we, weren't, we didn't have to do that because we were able to flow it while it was logging, so the water level is, the water is diverted out of there and the water level doesn't actually rise above that, which it would if it was shut in. As you can see, a big, relatively expensive operation, expensive from our point of view. So this is how, just of what actually went wrong at this well, this is what supposedly the well was like. The grey is cement and the blue is the aquifer down the bottom, it's schematic but pretty close to what it was supposed to be. That looks all right, should be fine. It was fine for 10 or 15 years. These are just the results, I'll skip past it because we can see it here. Basically that is how the well was, that's what we found. There were no leaks in the casing. The black casing was fine from top to bottom. Um, production zone was more or less where they said it should be. So the water, but what we could confirm was that that cement job, I'll show you here, the curve on the right hand side is from the cement bond survey, which shows that there was just essentially no cement below half the distance of the well, which meant that what happened was that when they did that cement job, they didn't do it how they were supposed to do it, and they, we believe, we can't tell for sure, we believe that that fractured the formation. In the 20 years since it was constructed, the water has, under pressure, fractured progressively higher, and one day it comes out of the surface. The problem with that well is you can't leave it like in that condition at the top because now with the water at the surface it's going to damage the wellhead and then you lose the ability to control the well at all. We wouldn't have been able to run these surveys and we wouldn't have been able to fix the well in the end. So what did we do? No, knowing this from our surveys, the client um, was able to, at great expense, fill the pond <coughs> with rubble, um, level it off and put a drill rig on top of it and over the well. And they proceeded to cement. So what, what we did first was we stopped the flow from the well by cementing up the bottom. But that's not enough because the water's still coming, still, still there and it's still in the annulus and it will continue to leak. So we also ran explosives in the well to basically blow holes in several parts of the bottom and then pumps. So you can see the cement at the bottom has, has stopped most of the flow from the well. But then the entire void there, the rest of what you see is blue, was then filled with cement. The inside of the casing and the outside was possible because it was perforated. And that was successful. In the end, the, the flow from the well and the leak has, has ceased. That's just 20,000 litres of cement were pumped in. And the mud, that, the mud that was in the well before has been forced by that cement out into the formation. So it's basically sealed that well off forever. And then they drilled a replacement hole because they still need the well. And this is where the cost comes in. Filling in the pit, drilling the replacement well, installing stainless steel casing so it doesn't happen again and constructing it prop properly dwarfs the cost of the survey to investigate what went wrong, but it still ended up costing millions of dollars in the end. If it had been constructed like this in the first place, none of this would have happened. And they would have had a well for another 10 or 15 years. And this is just a photo of the next well, because like I said, there are many, many more to fix. Um, one where the wellhead has gone, it's fallen off. So they're up there right now, um, finding out what's wrong with this one and ultimately we'll be filling it with cement. Thank you.
hundred years or more, the impact of um, leaking wells and uh, other aspects of the uh, extraction has meant that um, the basin is declining in, in terms of the pressures, and that's sort of some of the issues that we're trying to manage at the moment. Um, this program, the Gavity program, is funded for another couple of years, and all of the um, noise that's coming out of government at the moment is that there won't be another round of funding to press out of the Gavity, and so one of the things that we're grappling with and the board is grappling with and the Australian government, my public health base, I think, we're also grappling with is what we're doing for the future. Um, as I said, that more cost $3 million, which are a partial task for us, running our partial <coughs> Thanks very much. Cheers.